Welcome aboard, shipmates. This is Real Sailors, Real Sea Stories, a training program brought to you for the United States Naval Sea Cadet Corps by our supporters at the Navy Talent Acquisition Group in Philadelphia. I'm your host, Warrant Officer David Sheets, Commanding Officer of the John T. Dempster Jr. Division of the Naval Sea Cadet Corps. I am joined today by my all Navy support crew of MC1 Quinlan, who's our PAO, and STG1 Lewison, who is our technical support genius. Today's topic, what is it like to be a mass communication specialist, the MC rate in the United States Navy? Our presenter, our very special presenter, is stepping in front of the camera for this time only, is our own PAO, MC1, Diana Quinlan. Sea Cadets, this is not passive learning. This is active learning. So, during this presentation, if you have questions, and I hope you have plenty of them, because this is going to be a really great presentation, put them in the comment section. We'll read out your uh, questions on air, and Petty Officer Quinlan will do her best to respond. Also, you are also available to get two hours of virtual drill credit. How do you get that? Well, you complete the online quiz. This quiz will be active for only two days. And the URL for that quiz will be in the notes for this presentation once the recording is completed. So that's all you have to do. So without any further delay, Petty Officer Quinlan, the ship is all yours. Thank you, sir. Thank you for a wonderful introduction. And I'm glad everybody is here. I'll be talking to you again about MC rate, a little bit about public affairs um, and my sea story, what I do in the Navy, how I become a mass communication specialist and all that cool stuff. So let's start with sharing the presentation. I know PowerPoints, you know how it is in the military. All right. So I hope you're able to see everything. So as I said, uh, mass communication specialist, really we are the eyes and the ears of the Navy. What it means is Whatever we see, whatever we hear, we write it down, we film it, we take photos, and then we share it with the general public. So we technically tell the Navy stories. Uh, so a little bit about me as an introduction, and I will talk more about the cool stuff I've done in the Navy uh, and what, what awesome things that it allowed me to do. Uh, I'm originally from Riga, Latvia. I was born and raised there. I uh, came to the States when I was 18. Um, I did get my... Uh, college degree and my bachelor's uh, before I joined the Navy. So I kind of joined late, not to date myself. Uh, so my total year so far has been eight years. I actually shipped out to boot camp on December 7th. And of course, you know that December 7th is, uh, um, the, is the day that we commemorate as the attack on Pearl Harbor. So to me, it's near and dear, especially considering my first command and my first duty station. Um, so why did I join the Navy? Uh, it did appeal to me from a military st uh, the military structure and the adventures that I've seen people go through as they join the military. And I do also come from the family that was uh, serving practically every generation. Uh, both my grandparents, uh, my grandfathers and my grandmothers, uh, they served in World War II and uh, uh, both uh, both sides are very decorated um, um, veterans. Uh, they already passed away, but it's still their stories and just telling how they survived the World War II. It, it was just amazing. I loved hearing the stories and I loved uh, learning about the history of the World War II. So best thing about my job, as I said, we are the, the eyes of the Navy. We get to meet people all over the world uh, today I'll be talking, you know, to a seaman who's um, from Alaska, and you know, five minutes later I will be talking to an admiral. So it's just we're constantly moving, we're shifting, kind of behind the curtain. So there's there is still a chain of command, but we get to interact with everybody. It doesn't matter if it's you know E3 or O6 or or above, you know. So it's it's really cool that we get to see every little aspect in the Navy. Um, we get to see every job, uh, like on my ship, I used to love going from engineering way down below the decks to all the way to the fly deck and document whatever's happening down below all the way up to above. 
Um, and we do get to go on practically every single uh, naval platform uh, from ships to jets to helicopters to LCACs. And you will see some videos that I have here to share. Um, and again, it's meeting great people and telling their stories. That's the best thing. Like we get to immortalize these people, you know, that for them, they're just, you know, I'm an average Joe working and doing my job. But then their family sees their photos in the newspapers. The news is covering, you know, what their local sailor is doing somewhere in Japan. So to them, it's just this huge memory that they can keep through the entire lifespan. Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> uh, top Navy memory is actually meeting and talking to a Pearl Harbor survivors. Um, I think that's that's one of the greatest things because um, my both of my grandpas passed away before I was born, so I didn't get to hear their stories. So it's kind of I naturally gravitated to this uh, gentleman talking about you know their lives, how they joined the Navy, and uh, what they went through during the during the attack. Uh, some of their stories are incredible and. I actually have a bonus video in the end, so you'll have to stay stay around and watch the entire presentation. I'm sorry, uh, but you will see um, one of the stories from, uh, and it's, I mean, the story itself when I recorded it was an hour long. I had to compress it to three minutes, so you'll just have three minutes, but it's all encompassing what happened. And there's more, uh, there's so much more and we get to immortalize it. Um, and the, the other thing is I got to work with NASA uh, I was documenting the launch of the uh, one of their um, trying to remember the name. It's a it's a disc that they they were looking how it enters the atmosphere and how it will descend so they can project it how it's gonna work on Mars. Uh, so that was really cool because I got to stay in Kauai, Hawaii, for instead of three days, two weeks because there was just uh, weather conditions weren't allowed to launch. Um, and the other thing was working with the Discovery Channel. Uh, they came on board of our ship during their impact uh, in 2018. And um, so I got to lead the crew through the entire ship, show them around as they were filming the operations that to us, MCs, is just a normal thing that we record every day. To them, it's like, oh, wow, oh, this is cool, you know. Uh, and of course, they got to actually stand um, after the ship as we were launching an LCAC. So as you will see also in the video, again, you'll have to watch the presentation. Um, the LCACs put out a lot of massive wind. So <laughs> some of their camera gear got blown away. So that was a fun experience too, uh, but no damages, everything was fine. And there's a video on Discovery Channel somewhere where our ship is present. In my previous assignments, um, my first command, as I already said, was in Hawaii. I was stationed in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, uh, with Navy Public Affairs Support Element Vest. Um, then I went to Syracuse University, uh, upstate New York, and I went through a 10-month program for military military journalists. And uh, I went to photo photojournalism program, and the other part is video program. Now they kind of, I think, merging it together, which is a cool thing because you're still learning both sides of the MC world, and it's a joint um, joint program. So you have Navy, Air Force, Marines, Army. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't have any coasties. Um, from there, I went to Japan. Um, and that was amphibious assault ship Bonhomme Richard, and I do apologize, I say a lot of um, uh, but that's because English is my third language and sometimes it's hard to uh, connect the language barrier or breach it sometimes, and it's, it's funny that I'm MC, I'm supposed to tell the stories, and here I am umming all the time, but bear with me. So my my last comment uh, was in Japan, and it was amphibious assault ship Bonhomme Richard, uh, best ship in the world because it's my first ship and so far only ship, so I'm not going to recognize any other ships. Uh, and uh, from there, I came here to uh, Philadelphia and I'm working with the Navy Talent Acquisition Group Philadelphia and helping recruiters uh, in, in their job, but also highlighting their job because, you know, they are they are the window to the Navy. And, you know, this is the first person or the first sailor that some of the people meet uh, when they come to the Navy. Uh, 
for the first time, you know. So uh, these are some photos of myself. I don't really, uh, <laughs> I'm just saying, don't really like showing off too much, but here I am uh, telling my story. So these are some cool things I've done as MC. And as if you think about it, in eight years, it, it might seem to you right now as a long span of times, but in reality, it flies like this. I remember when I first joined, and as an MC, you signed a contract for five years initially. And I thought, oh, five years is so long. I don't know if I want to do this. Is it really something that, you know, uh, that I'm capable of doing, you know, physically, mentally, emotionally, and all that stuff. But it just, it just goes like this. Um, and so here... Uh, I will show you actually uh, this was in Hawaii one of the things that MCs can do and this is what training uh, was training for uh, the uh, sailors from local ships they would go into a firefighting training as you know each sailor is a firefighter uh, so MCs get to document it we get to fight fire as well uh, we get the training so uh, here you get all equipped and of course, camera gear with you. And this is the images that you get where sailors are putting out the fires. They're actually fighting fires and train how to respond to them. Uh, this would be inside the engineering spaces, um, training fire. And so from working with the, with the regular sailors, you know, E3s through E6s, the next day I might be documenting and take an interview with the uh, commander of the local ship. So it's just this little transition that I can be doing one thing here and the other thing there. It's it's constantly moving, constantly changing. You're never bored on your job. Uh, if you've been during the present our first presentation um, uh, with uh, Petaf Surprise, uh, he was talking about going through the uh, Hilo Dunker as MCs, as you can see over here. And over here, I got to be a coastie for a day. Uh, we do fly, so we have to go through the training as well uh, because we're supposed to know how to egress if the helicopter goes down. Again, it's <laughs> it's it's a really cool experience. Um, it's a lot of. Uh, it's not necessarily it's tough physically, it's tough mentally because you have to overcome. You, I mean, you see this water rushing as it fills in, so you have to think, okay. Do I freak out or do I figure out how am I supposed to, you know, remember all the training, how am I supposed to egress? Uh, and I'm saying it because talking about it is easy or seeing it, but actually doing it, that that's where you get in a little bit of a problem. Uh, for example, when I went through a couple of my junior MCs, uh, they didn't uh, receive the qualification because that mental aspect got to them. Uh, so unfortunately, they couldn't fly in the helos because of that. Um, again, you can do it over and over again until you get it, until you overcome that stress. And of course, in this situation, it's you know you are in a safe environment, so you know that it's a training, but it still does get to you. Um, it is a little now now kind of thinking about it, it's just like uh, do I want to do it again? Yeah, I'll do it again. <laughs> So, Petty Officer Quinlan, uh, you know, yes, since sir. I'm also air crew and I also had to do the same helo dunker thing, yeah, you're, if you're going to qualify for this, they do it four times, or at least they did at the time, right? The first two times were normal. The last two times, they actually blindfolded you, right? Yes, sir. Uh, for us, they actually did six times. Okay. Uh, so the reason it's six times because there's, uh, I think it's four types of helicopter egress that they're trying. So with different windows, uh, as you can see here, uh, right. people surfacing from this different areas. This opening right here, it's uh, in, in case something wrong uh, goes wrong and they have mm -hmm. to pull you out. But you have to, there's a windows that is completely open, like right here when you're flying. Uh, so it's it seems like an easy grass. You just strap, get ready, and uh, once the helo flips, you get out. Uh, there's one with, that has a 50 millimeter, uh, 50 millimeter? I believe 50 millimeter uh, uh, gun over, mount over here. So you have to find it and crawl it. And remember, because uh, helicopter flips, you upside down the entire time. So you have to figure out where, where you're feeling the area, how to get out of there. Um, 
Of course, there's also training for uh, ospreys. So osprey is picture over here, and you probably already uh, know or see them. Uh, that's actually on, me on fly deck running around taking photos. Uh, but as you can see, there is no windows you can technically grasp from, except for one little over here, and then you're looking for the door. And inside the osprey, if you haven't been inside of it, uh, the seats are lined up against the bulkhead, and you're just sitting in a row next to people. So the person who's closest to the egress, once they're ready to get out, they should tap a person next to them to remind them, hey, I'm, I'm out, you're next. <laughs> So you have to learn how to do all of those steps. And as I said, you get training technically in a day and it's just, it's a lot of things to remember. Um, but yeah, I'm not gonna go too much in it because I'm not, as you can see, I'm not very qualified, unfortunately. <laughs> well, it's, it's a good time and cadets, it's significantly harder than she's making it sound, okay. Uh, and uh, one of the things that, again, this is Australia. We did the uh, beach landing uh, with the Marines. So you see, I believe it was an AAV. Uh, and so you get to ride with the Marines as an amphibious vehicle. So it gets launched out of the back of uh, uh, LHD. And it just swims its way to the beach and rides it on. <laughs> so we didn't get to ride, unfortunately, because of the space and logistics and all that cool stuff. Uh, we rode the LCAC, which is, again, very awesome when we get to see it later. And the other cool thing about my job, uh, this is my first re-enlistment, and it was aboard a Mighty Mo. This um, is Missouri in uh, Pearl Harbor, right next to Arizona. Uh, so I got to the entire deck to myself, right under the guns, so I got re-enlisted, and as a present, unfortunately I don't have right now to show on me, um, I did a, uh, get a coin, and what the coin is, it's one of the holes over here uh, of the original uh, woodwork or the cover for, um, for the ship's deck. Um, my second re-enlistment, uh, which I've done Oh, 2018, yeah. Uh, so uh, almost a year and a half ago was inside the um, boilers of my ship. So this is my triad, my commanding officer at the time, uh, XO and CMC that came down that you crawl through probably like this big of a space. I don't know if you can see. <laughs> uh, so you crawl inside and during the underway, this entire area, uh, this brick walls, and you know, uh, they're filled with fire. I'll show you photos later again uh, of how we light the fire. Engineering lights the fire before we get underway. And so this is a huge hot box. Even though the fire were put out um, and we were in port for a couple of weeks, you can still feel the heat that is contained in there. Uh, it's probably like hundred degrees in there just uh, at the time. So not only I got to crawl in there and re-enlist, but I got to drag my entire uh, triad and my department with me so they can stop over with me in there. <laughs> but it was an awesome experience and have being re-enlisted uh, re uh, by my commanding officer, Ka Captain LeBron, absolutely fantastic man. Uh, if you're ever in the Navy and get to serve with him, ah. You're a lucky, lucky people. <laughs> All right. So uh, about the actual MCs. Uh, the coolest thing, I think, to me, and again, it's more of a historical aspect, because the rate is very young. It was formed in 2006, and it's, uh, as you can see here in the write-up, it's a combination of uh, JOs, journalists, uh, uh, photographers' mates, uh, lithographers, and draftsmen. And so they form it all together as a one big rate. So MCs now, we know how to do the graphics, we know how to do videos, we know how to do photos, write the stories, uh, we're ju jacks of all trades, so to say. Uh, we even do broadcasts and radio, uh, we stand and do military news, so in front of the camera, uh, not a fan of it myself, but at some point I might have to do it too. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, the, the rate itself, when it was formed, uh, the uh, rating badge 
that we have now is an MCs, and it's a globe with a satellite circling around it, uh, and lighting, uh, lightning coming from uh, four corners, uh, which is kind of showing that we get the news and we get them out to the world as soon as possible. So immediacy of our of our job. Uh, it was designed by a draftsman uh, that was on board Bonhomme Richard. And then I was stationed there when it was the 10th anniversary of, uh, of our raid. So that's kind of cool little history stuff that I find it's kind of amazing. Um, so it, it's a good to celebrate. But I mean, um, how, how do you know what's happening in the military? How do you know what, what people are doing there? It's because MCs like us, we're constantly working, we're finding stories, the stories to tell because, you know, one day you meet a, a sailor who, you know, looks like another average sailor. I mean, we all look the same when we wear a uniform, right? But everyone has their story. So it's not necessarily telling the story of what's happening in the world right now or you know the ship getting underway but telling also sailor stories because uh, maybe they are like third or fourth generation military or they've done something before or while in the military that is very considerable that you want to tell the world about it and of course on top of that yes we do cover everything in between and so uh give me one second this is the video I wanted to share uh, that we made at my command, uh, my first command. Uh, Take back this will tell you a little bit what MCs do. Me sky. So just let's the watch it and I'll explain so later. Bright, I can't open my eyes. And days like this is where we found our love. So please, Mr. Weatherman. Bring us the sun. So yeah, we do the basic things too. We do exercise and stuff <laughs> like any other sailor. Um, but just to say a little bit why the video uh, looks like that, this is a stop animation and the video was created out of, I think we were 9,000 photos. And that's why uh, how we could make all those cool effects that you're seeing now. We hopelessly fell. And I'll challenge anybody call my bluff. Cause I am so deeply and hopelessly loved. <laughs> Jump in the water like the summers of old. And we'll stay out here making most of the sun until our two shadows find all the way home. And I said that old time will tell that in love we hopelessly fell. I'll challenge anybody, call my bluff, cause I am so deeply and hopelessly loved. And who wouldn't love being in Hawaii and actually working there and living there for three years? Uh, so that's a little bit of footage of that. It's just awesome. <laughs> Take back your weather and bring me the sky. The day so bright I can't open my eyes. And days like this is where we found our love. So please, Mr. Weatherman, bring us the sun. That was really cool. You're saying those are individual pictures? 
Yes, sir. So uh, as, as you probably know, or maybe heard the the videos that we see every day, uh, they're made out of frames. So if mm -hmm. you imagine this, each uh, of those photos is an individual frame that creates this entire video. So yeah, the, the entire video was shot out of thousands and thousands of photos just put in one streamline uh, to create it. And I think it kind of tells a little bit better than uh, what the MCs do or are capable of. Um, I wanted to initially share the American's Navy video about MCs, and I, I think uh, everyone can see that one, but having having something that shows, okay, we write stories, we make graphics, so, you know, we create videos, and we were being creative with it, uh, it tells a little bit more than just standard, this is the list of what we do. Uh, so that's why I want to share it. Right. Just, and then right, you're, right, right. you're interacting. You're interacting with your, you know, the, your shipmates and and all that type of stuff. And you can see everybody's having a good time. Oh yeah, it was fun. The pictures you took at the time, they're all having a good time. So perfect. All right. So what I do as MCs, and you can see it's uh, quite a long list. Um, we do uh, learn a lot. We do learn again how to write news. Uh, and there's so many different aspects to the uh, news stories. You can write it as a standard, when, what, uh, where, when, or you can make it a feature story, which is almost like creating a book or a novel, but it tells somebody's story still or provides the information that people want to know. We do, uh, obviously, photography, and it ranges from actual historic documentation documentation of the events uh like change of command uh sorry one second <laughs> phone is ringing as always <laughs> uh so uh change of command or christening of a ship uh or like in the photo over here um nasa was trying to do a, a new launch to to the pretty much scientific information uh, update or information uh, how to launch in the atmosphere of Mars or um, pretend, but still, you know, learn from it, get the information. And we document that, uh, for example, I was on land right next to the uh, launch area uh, while my chief was out at sea on the boat um, waiting for it to recover. So he got to document the recovery process when once the balloon landed. Uh, so uh, the other thing, of course, uh, all the standard Navy photos, uh, you know, the sitting nicely like this <laughs> for the boards and things like that, we document that as well. So we're on the studio um, and there's multitude of, you know, the processing for us that we have to go through uh, in order to release this information too. Uh, for photos, for example, we have to write caption that is embedded inside the photo. So whoever opens it on the other side of the world, uh, they can see the information when the photo was taken, uh, what it's all about. Say, for example, um, you know, uh, aircraft is launching off the deck of such and such ship, and that way we ha they have that information already embedded, and generations from now people can see it and know when it happened and what happened. Uh, multimedia design and production, uh, it can be a combination of uh, videos, photos, graphics that we put together as an information, um, as something fun like we did with a video, uh, or uh, any other applications that we need for, for the Navy. Uh, pretty much telling the story, as always. Um, let's see. Uh, designs uh, like... Uh, well, actually, design for uh, for this project, uh, uh, having a logo. We create those. We create crests for the ships, uh, and whatever you know, command my request. It might be just a coin for the command or commanding officer, or you know, the first class petty officer association, something like that. Um, we do newspapers and magazines. Uh, on my ship, we did the. Uh, uh, <laughs> The Almanac. There we go. I had to remember for a second. It's a magazine where we uh, where would we would feature uh, what is happening in the ship because you know sailors. It's a morale raiser. They want to see 
themselves on the photos. I mean, look at the Facebooks and Instagrams and everything. People are just, you know, taking selfies and sharing. It's constantly a visual share the, of the photos. So when you're underway and you're working, you don't have necessarily time for yourself. When somebody takes a photo, you, even if you don't notice it, but then you see it, you open the magazine or um, go online and your mom is screaming, hey, I saw you doing this and that, and you're thousands of miles away. It's a huge morale booster for people. Um, <clears throat> uh, so we also do uh, radio, radio and television. Um, in that regard, uh, we have a uh, on different bases, um, practically all the bases, if I if I'm not mistaken. There is a local uh, station that is run by military. Uh, where we do announcements, spots, uh, all kind of inf sharing information, and of course DJing, playing music, so you can do that as well. Uh, for that, uh, you can go through a broadcasting school, and it's a C school for us. It's um, it's it might be they might start teaching it now in A school. When I went through it, uh, they weren't teaching it then yet. Uh, in fact, they weren't teaching social media skills either. Uh, <laughs> Not too long ago, if you think about it, just eight years ago, but Facebook was kind of eh, here and there, uh, and people uh, didn't consider it as a you know teaching element. Now all the graduates uh, or all the MCs graduating from I uh, sorry A school, uh, they they learn how to manage social media. So they they come out as almost like a full package, so they can go and operate in the fleet, and they have to learn very little from the fleet. And so we conduct, and I'm kind of skipping and jumping, but you probably already read it through through it a few times. Uh, of course, we conduct uh, interviews. Uh, we conduct interviews with within the military. We can conduct interviews with civilians. It really depends what the story is and what we're trying to tell with it. And not to hold you too long on the details, let's roll to the next thing. And that's what I'm talking about. Obviously, these are just photos. These are not, you know, written stories. And I don't really like writing, but I've written a lot. <laughs> uh, and so those uh, uh, can be found on Navy.mil. Like any story you're looking for in a Navy about any subject, this is where SMC write the stories and send it to. But also it goes into uh, local newspapers. Uh, they go to all over the country and get shared uh, so the information is getting distributed to to the people so they can learn more about what the navy is doing today or about uh, this sailor or that sailor doing whatever jobs they're doing but uh i think uh i don't know the photos kind of tell their own stories um as i was talking to uh, about the sail each sailor being a firefighter we do drills because it has to be a muscle memory. Uh, so if something happens, you don't have to run for a manual and look through it. How do I put out the fire? You know, what type of fire it is? You just know. You just run and do it. Uh, so as MCs, um, because if something happens, any damage, anything like that, we document that as well. We will have a duty MC who's covering every uh, uh, GQ, so general quarters. Uh, so even though it's training, even though it's drill, we're still documented because it's training for us. And while uh, on the ship, the sailors will report to individual lockers. So like Department A will report to, you know, F, Department B to report to Medic Center or something like that, uh, Medic Bay. Uh, that duty MC can walk through the entire ship. We can go from DC Central to engineering, uh, top side to the flight deck, all the way to the bridge, and check what each uh, each locker is doing, uh, how they training, and of course, you know, during the drills, uh, there's different scenarios that are happening. It can it can be different types of fire happening in this uh, <clears throat> in this part of the ship, or you know, there's flooding happening in this side of the ship. Uh, whatever the casualty, uh, sailors will respond, and MC will go and tone, uh, document it and show um, that they are training, but also train 
uh, as to if this was a real situation, where I need to be, how do I document it? So that can be used for investigation or whatever the information needs to be used for. Uh, Do you pretty much have like free reign of the ship? Yeah, yes, sir. Um, I mean, as I said, I've been from the very, very bottom of the ship, uh, right where the shafts are, uh, climbing all the way to the bridge, and one of the jobs that MCs also do, and we help um, ISs with it, is a Snoopy team. So whenever there's unidentified aircraft or ship uh, or any kind of platform nearby, we would get called away to document it. So for us, uh, at least on my old ship, our um, print shop where we worked uh, at, uh, was on the same deck as engineering, so it was five decks below, and then so we had to run five decks up just to get to the hangar bay. But you have to go all the way in the Walters Row or the bridge, and the Walters Row is like way over here, so it's two decks, uh, two levels above the fly deck. So total is what? Yeah, seven decks. Nine nine decks that you have to sprint yeah. in two minutes. <laughs> And you have to remember that the ladders are like at this angle and they're very, you know, uh, narrow. You have your camera gear, you have either video camera or, you know, your still camera and you lagging it. <laughs> so you have to be everywhere. And the other thing is, yeah, there, uh, each department might have some kind of awards happening or captain has uh, a guest in, in his uh, or hers um, cabin uh, or they call you on the bridge because they want to document something or even if it's just a pretty photo that they want to take and you know share with everybody uh, you you're everywhere you are absolutely everywhere uh, and, and that's the another cool thing uh, about our job is we again as like eyes and ears of the navy we're we're everywhere and we get to pass through um it, it, it's kind of weird to explain. We're like uh, an outside observer almost. We're still in the Navy, we're still doing the Navy job, we still train, but when it comes to documenting things and something happened here, we're just swiveling around and documenting it from all angles. So it, it is, we kind of get a free reign in, in that regard. And that's what I wanted to show. Uh, I was uh, uh, working a night shift so in the middle of the night when the entire, well, ship never sleeps, but the majority of the crew is asleep and only an eye check is working at the time. Uh, and technically the only people say, for example, what, working on a flight deck, if there's late night uh, flight operations, like you see right here, or if it's a uh, maintenance crew, so they will be working on the uh, helicopters, excuse me, or the other craft during the night. Um, so they're the only one technically authorized to be there, but MC can go out and document them working. Uh, this is a forward lookout that is <clears throat> uh, working at night. So even though you see, it seems like it's light enough out, uh, this is very dark night. So you, you're playing with the settings on your camera in order to document and you drop a, uh, your shutter speed down and you open the aperture as much as you can uh, just to, to get a little bit of glimpse of light. Like uh, during the night, all you see is this tiny little green light and a little bit of a light on the forward lookout, but that's about it. And you, you get to see things that technically nobody sees and nobody sees with a naked eye. Let's put it that way. Uh, and then again, you can document uh, air operations, you can work with Marines. Uh, these are uh, Marines um, during replenishment at sea. Uh, so like uh, Pet Officer Price was talking about, he would be sitting inside that helicopter and hooking up the pallet uh, while they're on the ground and there would be a team of, uh, uh, team of two. Uh, one is a spotter, the other one is actually the, the person who will hook the pallet to the helicopter. And as an MC, as you can see, I'm sitting right here under the tail. And even in the photo, it looks like it's far away. It probably was hovering like 
maybe about like this. I would probably reach my hand uh, and touch it if I wanted to. I didn't. <laughs> uh, that would be dangerous. Um, and then, yeah, going from the fly deck to the engineering spaces, uh, you can see right here what he was doing. Uh, as I was saying, you know, we were in a boiler when it didn't have fire. Uh, he's lighting up the boiler. Uh, so what they do, they, uh, they light up the wand. Sorry, my, <laughs> my accent coming through. Uh, to, to, to light it up. And they have probably opening like this big that they have to aim uh, that fire, get it in there. And fingers crossed it will light up and everything, you know, in the universe comes together and they will get in the first try. In fact, everybody is trying to get in the first try because it's, you know, a good luck. And it's like bragging rights again that I, li uh, I lit the uh, boilers in the first try. So that's that's a cool thing that we get to see as well. I mean, majority of the ship or sailors on the ship probably will not see it. Uh, unless we share the photos, of course. And um, uh, here's uh, working with the divers. Uh, I personally didn't get to dive with them, uh, but as an MC, there's another as aspect of it that our C school is so versatile. You can learn uh, from the details of doing, say, for example, graphic design, uh, like here, I'll show you my favorite ship so as I said I don't know if you can see it but making the planet of your ship you know doing some cool graphic designs and you get in-depth education on it or you can go through air crew school like petty officer price went through it for his job but you learn it as an MC so you become um, aerial photographer so which means uh, for example when we I go flying with the <clears throat> with the helicopter squadrons, they cannot take me on board uh, before sunrise or past sunset because that's an um, a it's dangerous, but it's it, it's extra uh, what the word I'm looking for uh, extra danger I guess <laughs> uh, extra liability. There we go. But if I would have the air crew qualification then they can take me at any hours of the day or night whenever they have to fly because I do have the qualification. I went through the same school as their air crewman. Uh, same applies for diver, uh, for divers. Uh, what we used to have was a combat camera and uh, unfortunately it's the command itself no, more, no longer exists, uh, but MCs, uh, they still can go through the training and one of the training is uh, receiving the qualification as a diver so you would go with the eod units with cbs and whatever um in uh, jobs they're doing underwater you go underwater with them and you document it so and uh, Quinlan, first of all you should go through air crew school because it's a lot of fun <laughs> uh but i do have a question from you from one of our cadets and it has to do with I, I believe some of the the underwater pictures here is were you actually underwater here and did you have to get some sort of uh, swimmer qual or dive qual in order to take these pictures or how, how are they taken okay uh, yeah so this photo right here in this corner uh, I was underwater um, I, I was with a camera uh, I think I had a GoPro at the time because we didn't have the proper housing for the camera uh, but for for that, uh, all we had to do at my first command is go and get the second class second class swimmer qual, and it's it's similar to qualification you receive in boot camp, but that's making sure that you know you're your own man and you know how to um, be underwater, so you're not gonna freak out or be a liability to divers who are going through the training in this instance. Uh, so here's a SAR swimmer doing training how to rescue a, a um, pilot with a parachute. Uh, for me, as an MC, all I had to do is dive in the pool, you know, uh, get a, as low as I could and, and take my photos. But that way, while they still keep an eye on me, uh, they always will keep an eye on the person in the pool, of course. Same as in the fly deck, there's handlers who will keep an eye on an MC working. Um, 
they they weren't worried you know the not necessarily like they weren't worried but you know they they know that i have the quali- qualification and that um i know what to do in case something happens uh so for that it was just a second class uh swim qualification and if i remember correctly uh it's you have to complete a four types of different swim uh so it's a freestyle um, backstroke, something else and something else. I'm sorry, I don't remember. <laughs> uh, you have to hold what, uh, um, breath underwater for five minutes and you have to do a uh, jump from the tower. So it, it, it's, again, it's, uh, it's not that tough physically. Yeah, you know, you have to swim back and forth so it can be strenuous. Uh, but it's it's more mental again that you know you have to go through that qualification you go through that training uh, but I I was swimming since I was yay high <laughs> uh, so to me on being in the water underwater is never was an issue uh, I I was on the swimming team way before the military <laughs> so it's an, it was an easy day for me um, but yeah it's uh, it's better if you have qualifications or uh, you go through the training. And again, this is not necessarily mandated. Uh, the helo dunker, yes, it is, because you are, uh, again, you, your safety is primarily. Uh, but, you know, getting underwater, as long as you know how to swim and you're not getting in the way of training or the divers, then you're good to go. Uh here you will have to go through the training. So here, that's why I never dove with the actual divers because I never went through the full training to become a diver. That's why. Okay, so we have another good question, uh, <laughs> which is if you are stationed somewhere that comes under attack for whatever reason, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Do you document the attack? Do you? How do? You, what does an MC do in that case? Do you run for cover? Do you? look for somebody bigger to hide behind? I mean, what what do you do in that case? So um, I'm going to tell you what I do uh, as, you know, my personal reaction would be. Uh, it's not necessarily the correct answer, though. I have to say it's not the Navy's answer because Navy's answer obviously is safety first. And if you cannot document it right there and then you don't have your equipment or anything, Go for safety. Go for cover. You know, protect yourself. You you will still be in uh, employed because uh, you will be documenting the aftermath. So, for example, a good friend of mine who went through school together um, in Syracuse. Uh, she uh, she's in the Air Force and became an officer recently. Yay! <laughs> uh, but. Uh, she was stationed, uh, I believe, in Afghanistan recently, and uh, there was an attack on base. And yes, their first, first response was safety of the personnel. You have to make sure that everybody is safe and only those who are trained to respond will respond to the situ- situation. But as her team, once the everything was you know, relatively safe and secure, uh, their job was to cover the damages. Their job was to cover what happened uh, and release that information to the appropriate, you know, either news media or um, to the higher ups. So, A, they can do investigation. Uh, B, they can measure, you know, how much damage has been done. So, this is the correct answer. Now, as an MC that has... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the mm, how to say it correctly but what what uh and i was talking to warrant officer already about it and i keep reminding myself and my sailors that work for me is when you have your camera in your hands and you have that you know lens to um to the viewfinder to your eye it almost feels like it removes you from the scene and only whatever cap- a camera captures is what you see. Uh, so it gives you that false sense that you're invulnerable. So nothing can happen to you, you're as safe as possible, which is a 
really, really, really bad thing. <laughs> it's it's not something that you want to get used to and think, oh, you know, like, oh, I'm documenting this is cool thing and forget about your personal safety. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, when things happen, yes, we need to do initial documentation. One of the things that happened on our ship was, um, and thankfully it was just a minor thing, uh, but we had a jet, uh, one of the jets like this, uh, catch on fire. And this was small electrical fire, but because it's a muscle memory for, for example, a flight deck crew, they all mustered up, you know, uh, and got ready to put a uh, fire all the way up to the jettison of the, of the jet. As MCs, as soon as we heard it on one MC, all we could think, grab the camera, go. You know, so this is our response to it. Uh, uh, obviously, it's not a like combat situation, but when you know something like that is happening, this is when, yeah, you're the one who sees it and documents it for the future. So you grab the camera and you go and you document it. Obviously, you remain, uh, remain in this case uh, at a safe distance. You don't get in the way of first responders. So you're constantly mindful of where you are, but you also want to get that shot. So it's kind of a balance. Uh, again, in reality, your safety comes first. Uh, personally, I thankfully, <laughs> according to my family, <laughs> I, I haven't seen combat or haven't been uh, to the situations where it's, oh my God, you know, run and hide. Um, and when, if and when that kind of situation appears, uh, I will make the right decision. But as uh, as an MC, you get that intuitive, like, I have to get the headshot of the action, you know, I have to be there. And while that thought comes to you, it's not exactly the right response. Uh, it's, it's it's important to document, but remember about your safety. That That's the biggest, I guess, input that I should say, <laughs> that I should put out. Um, and so... Yeah, uh, I hope it answers the question. Uh, there, um, I know quite a few of MCs uh, that are good friends of mine um, who either been sta stationed where they've seen combat or been assigned to even uh, SEALs. And the first thing for them, they're trained at this case, at this situation, they're trained as rifleman first, cameraman second. So you protect yourself, you fire the weapon to protect your team, and then you'll document it. Um, the, that's, um, that's the best way to, uh, to explain it. Safety first, documentation comes after that. And anyone will tell you the same thing. Just don't, it's just, as I said, when you have the camera, you feel like, oh, I can go anywhere and shoot anything. But you have to remember that you want to come home too. You want to uh, be safe. Uh, and I want to show some cool stuff that we've shot so far. Just to unwind and get off the bad subjects or anything like that. So this is a carrier. Uh, we had Marines on board and they are the one that launched the carriers. And one of the things that we do is you know, stand right there next to them on the fly deck and document all the operations. So, as I was saying, handlers in the yellow shirts, uh, they will, as you will see, they, they pretty much the eyes and ears of the planes and jets and helicopters as they launch and uh, land on the fly deck. So, just being an MC, we get to document what, say, handlers do on a daily basis. But we, because of our job, the routine of doing the same thing over and over and over and over again, say on a fly deck, it's gone because today I'm standing on a fly deck documenting the jet taking off. Uh, tomorrow, as I said, I'm in the well deck looking um, at the LCAC launch or I'm flying in the helo and watching this jet launch from the air. It can be so many different things. Uh, and again, there's just more more imagery that uh, showing 
the the scope and the areas we get to go to. Um, so this is a drill. Don't freak out. It's it's a little bit graphic, but it's a prosthesis. Uh, he's he's not injured in any way. Uh, but this is a medical drill in the ship, and this is surgeons who you go inside the actual surgical room. You get to see how they would respond if something were to happen. And there are IMCs who actually document the actual surgeries. Uh, so the the there's so many aspects that we get to see uh, that say only medical personnel or select medical personnel will see themselves and not anyone else on board unless they see our photos. Uh, the other cool thing, you get to stand next to the Sea Whiz and uh, it's kind of hard to tell how far away I am from it, uh, but it was about two and a half, uh, six and a half feet, seven feet, sorry, I'm more metric, so. Um, but this is, it's going full fire training and it's kind of hard to see because it's a small photo, but there's a few pallets that you can see that's the actual ammo flying out of there. Uh, Right here, uh, it's a, a replenishment at sea that was happening at night. Uh, very, very dangerous evolution because you have, even during the day, but this is at night where visibility is practically all the little lights that you see. And even that with a camera, you see more of an exposed uh, light than you see with your naked eye. Um, uh, so <clears throat> both ships, uh, moving side by side at a certain speed. They were not just, you know, sitting on anchor and transporting goods. We're still moving and streaming the uh, the certain speeds uh, while the sailors right here uh, were pushing fuel into our ship. Uh, there would be another line that they're transporting cargo. So you get to see those cool things. Um, I'm not saying we don't participate in the rest, Sometimes you shoot photos and then you go and start pushing boxes yourself. But that's how we get uh, get our food, our mail, everything. Uh, Betty Officer Price already touched on this because uh, they're part of the evolution during the day. They will actually fly a helicopter here and back to our ship and bring the pallets back and forth. So that's, I don't know, that's really cool things that we get to do. I mean, being outside at night and seeing stars when the rest of the crew is asleep. That's something cool you get to do. Uh, the other thing right here, uh, anchoring evolution. So you get to be on a foxhole, see the actual anchoring evolution. So all the boatswain's mates running around, making sure that you know chain is moving properly. There's you know everybody's safety, securing the chain for the anchor. But you get to stick your head out of the side of the ship and actually see it splashing in the water. Uh, like maybe a few other BMs will be doing it, but not the entire crew. And then, you know, a little MC pops their head out too with a camera. <laughs> and again, back to engineering, they're uh, near and dear to me because I did a lot of engineering coverage. Uh, this is uh, the just lit the boiler. So remember the photo when he has um, one with a fire? Uh, this is where they would normally put it here. I think this one, they were just uh, cleaning the equipment and changing it out, but you still can see the steam going, going out, the little bit of, uh, not even the steam, but the smoke from the fire coming out from the boiler. Uh, and, you know, they would be all dressed up in order to prevent any kind of damages to themselves and to the equipment around them. And this photo... <laughs> I really love it because I uh, I love being in the fly deck. I think that's the most fun. Um, m well, aside from flying too. Um, but the thing with the fly deck, uh, whenever uh, any kind of aircraft is taken off, especially the rotor, uh, you get a lot of rotor wash. And that's a lot of wind that's pushing you like pretty much plastering you either to the deck or trying to uh, sweep you off the deck. Um, in this case, what this Osprey is doing, it's not just uh, doing vertical takeoff, it's doing running takeoff. So it's pushing a lot more uh, rotor wash on the people standing on the fly deck. So you can see, I, I call it praying to the mighty Osprey. 
Um, but you can see Marines practically on their knees uh, in order to hold on for, for their lives so it doesn't blow them away. Uh, and you can see the pad eyes over here. Sometimes uh, I remember taking this photo and I'm standing a little bit further than they are um, or crouching. And I still had to uh, grab my fingers through the pad eye while I'm holding the camera in this hand and trying to shoot while I'm practically blinded by the wind blowing uh, or pressing the goggles to my face so hard. And it's, I'm telling it as a fun, but it is dangerous. It was fun to me. <laughs> uh, but, you know, you are in flight deck. There's so many moving parts. Uh, there's rotor wash and people do get blown away. So you have to be constantly on the lookout. It's uh, your head has to be spinning 360. Um, and so you can't forget that this little piece of plastic that you have in front of your face that is going to protect you because, I mean, the camera gets blown away with you, obviously. So, but, but yeah, it's just one of the cool aspects is documenting them uh, who's working with those aspirates to constantly on the fly deck, still bending to this wind and trying, you know, to to withstand that, you know, gale force that is pushing them down. It's it, it's really cool thing that we get to do. And, you know, this is just photos, you, you know, imagine videos and stories that we that we can write and push out and, you know, tell the story of this individual Marine or this sailor and what they do. And about the storytelling, <laughs> excuse me, um, this photo, uh, this is one of the projects that I did in Hawaii. Um, I was following a project called um, Coast of History, I believe. Yes, Coast of History. Um, and what the, the people were doing, and it's primarily in Europe because that's where a lot of uh, fighting was happening during World War II. So they will take black and white photos of, you know, um, war actions and take the photos of to what it looks like today, the same area, and they position them on top of each other to showcase what it looked like, you know, 75 years ago or now more than 75 during the, the actual uh, war, during the fighting, and what it looks like now, how, uh, how the time, you know, wipes away this, um, this damage, this, you know, the horror of the war. Um, so in preparations for December 7th, uh, that's when we do a commemorative uh, event uh, at Pearl Harbor, and when we meet all the Pearl Harbor survivors, when they come out and tell their stories, uh, I, I made this project with my team uh, where I went around the Pearl Harbor and documented the areas uh, that you can see in black and white photos. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So I went to the archives there and requested some of the black and white photos of the area during the attack. And I used them. So it's pretty much was... Uh, standing with a photo like this uh, in on a location and trying to figure out if that's the right spot. And you just, you know, you aligning the mountains, you're aligning the pier and all of that in order to, to get the, the closest uh, location and the closest position that the photographer in 1941 stood in order to document it to where I am now. Uh, and it's uh, talking to, again, to Pearl Harbor survivors and those who were there or historians to confirm, okay, is this the right location? Is this uh, what this happened? Uh, so here you can see, uh, let me see. This is on the Ford Island. And if I'm not mistaken, that should be Arizona right there. I might be mistaken a little bit, but anyways. So it, it's combining those photos and bringing what was, what was happening uh, oh, 79 years ago now uh, to how it looks, how the area looks now. And it's just kind of bringing this uh, time gap or bridging it together to show what it looked then and what it looked now, which is, I mean, that was a really fun project to do. and. Just, you know, it brings closer to the history and remembering 
what the people went through during the attack. Uh, it just, to me, it's kind of spe spectacular. And I, I'd love to share their stories. I wanted to be remembered, you know, what happened on that day. And I wanted to show it. All right. So I think it's enough for photos. If I'm mistaken, Patrick, not mistaken. I have a, oh, a couple ahead. quick, quick questions for you that came in. All right. So say like the ship that you were talking, the amphibious assault, that wasp class ship. How many MCs are generally on the ship like that? Okay. Because they, I guess it would vary depending on the ship size. But when you're on that ship, you were a, a team of how many people? Okay, so on uh, on BHR, uh, there was a total, like, average number of MCs, about eight. Uh, the largest crew for MCs we had was, I believe, 11. Um, the smallest was three, uh, because the Navy building constantly shifts. So there will be people leaving, people coming in, people leaving, com coming in. Uh, so that's why sometimes you get this imbalance of how many people working at the same time. Uh, normally, amphibs, uh, the ships of that size, abilitated for about 14 MCs total, plus or minus, uh, plus or minus two. Uh, in comparison, if you go on the carriers and MC, you have up to 32, 36 MCs working there, but they're working in a different department. So. Um, one group of MCs will be doing photography, one group will be writing story, one group just working in a print shop and doing prints for, for the ship. Uh, in On the Amphib, we were doing everything at the same time. Uh, so I think, yeah, the biggest we had was 11. Um, most of the time we, we did it, we, we got away with eight, uh, getting it done. And it's actually a good question because I didn't touch on it before uh, how the MCs, uh, how, how we work in the sense that we don't go on a small voice. So we don't get assigned to the stores or um, cruisers as a part of the ship's crew. We might deploy with them on individual deployments. Uh, if, if you know, our command deems so, and it will be uh, Navy Public Affairs uh, support element, that's what they do. They will augment uh, smaller ships with one MC who will go out and document things. But the only ships that actually get MCs as part of the crew is carriers and amphibs. And of course, we can work with the squadrons where we are assigned to the squadrons, like um, P3 squadrons and since P3 gone away, so it would be P8s, uh, and so on. So uh, also CBs. Uh, so hopefully we'll have a video for you or a presentation for you about CBs and uh, that uh, the CBs battalions, they will probably have one MC assigned to them. Again, it all depends on the billets. Uh, so just a little bit of information how the MC rate fork. Again, we're everywhere. So... Great. And Thank you. Was there another question? Sorry. Yeah, or? Uh, yeah another question is, uh, do MCs stand watch? And I guess it's more of the traditional watches, or are you have different duties because of your assignments? Okay. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's weird how how MCs stand watch. Uh, so, for example, in my first command, because it was a detachment. Uh, we didn't have the standard watch that you would think where, you know, you have five hours where you're standing on a quarter deck and, uh, you know, you uh, lead the log for the quarter deck and, you know, announce people coming on board or answering phones or something like that. Uh, at the detachment, we had what was a week duty. And what it meant is any events, uh, because we were covering the entire uh, part of Pearl Harbor for any events that were happening, so any kind of ceremonies, um, studio, and things like that. So if something was happening after working hours or during the weekend, as a duty MC, you would cover that event. So you didn't stand technically a watch watch. You just were um, duty MC who will go and cover events. Uh, when you are assigned uh, to the ship, so like I was a ship's crew, I wasn't uh, attached through, through other commands, uh, then we did stand watch. Uh, we only stand watch uh, during port. 
So there is no watches for MC underway unless it's, you know, for drills or GQs. And that's just one, one MC that's going to be assigned to that. And they just cover it throughout the deployment. Um, so while you are in port, you will stand the standard watch on the quarter deck. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's, uh, uh, for me, I started as a petty officer of the watch. Uh, as being a second class at the time, and once you um, rank up to the first class, you will be an officer. Officer of the deck. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> all of a sudden my my brain forgot how to speak. Um, but anyway, so it's a five-hour watch that you're standing, and there will be a rotation. So one day you will be standing it, uh, you know, from seven to twelve, and the other day you will be standing it, you know. Um, from uh, midnight to, you know, 05. Uh, so it really rotates and you're responsible for the quarter deck. So anyone coming through or leaving, if it's somebody high ranking, you have to announce them properly. Uh, so as a petty, petty officer of the watch, you actually would ring the bell, uh, however bells they require, and you will announce them over one MC, then, you know, such and such is arriving. And you also do a standard announcements for the ship. Uh, so, for example, if there is cleaning, excuse me, cleaning stations, uh, you will announce that. You, you know, so it's there. There is a watch standing if you are a ship's crew and if you are in port. Uh, at my current command, I don't really have any watches. I don't stand watch per se. But then again, if there's, because I document a lot of events or I help coordinate them, uh, if there's event uh, after hours or during the weekends or even holidays, I will be out there and documenting it or doing my job pretty much. So it's not, um, not watch standing per se, but it's still kind of duty MC, MC job. So I hope that answers the question. I know like watch standing is, is, something that you might be interested in. And uh, it, it's, it's, it's a good experience. Uh, again, it's, you're learning about the ship, uh, you're learning about your duties, and you're passing that information and that knowledge to the people who are junior to you or who are learning to stand the same watch. So, you know, the ship is always secured. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. And I'm gonna, I hope I'm not taking too much of your time, but I'm gonna roll, I think, in the next video. All right. So I was talking about LCACs. I absolutely love them. And this LCAC crew, I flew with them. Yes, LCACs are flying there or gliding. Uh, they're not swimming or <laughs> sailing. Uh, so this is a little bit of an um, idea and it was made for general public, an idea what it's like to be inside the pilot house on the LCAC when it takes off from the well deck of the ship and uh, does the beach landing. And you will see from then what they can carry. So it's more like information slash look, look what Navy does kind of cool thing. So I hope you enjoy. actually what you're seeing right now is outside the well deck and we are coming up on cushion so you're lifting up that air fills up the cushion under the LCAC uh, but it's BMs because you're backing out uh, from the well deck 
they are actually kind of guiding you what what needs to be happening, what what you need to do. Now bags at the cell. You clear, Cybercon? Roger. You are clear to port. <coughs> you got eyes on zero nine? Uh, zero nine is up on port quarter at a mile and a half. They yes. are well clear. All right, Mothers forward. Press right. coming around. Forward. All right, All right. Now, I can come left to uh, 250. Clear to port, gun. Roger, 250. I got eyes on 0 I should combo lay that. Um, steady up on 270. Clear to port, gun. Let's contact. Roger. that clicking in the background that you hear it's an MC taking photos as well so home running video on there taking photos good job nice Uh, you're clear to go and dig is part of the reconnaissance team uh, so it's a combination of marines and a navy they've been on that beach since about four in the morning because uh, they will come out and investigate first before we actually start the landing uh, of all the vehicles I have to say I got yelled a little bit for standing too close when they were flying up. So, but all you get is a lot of sand in your face and on the camera. So, fun memories. And I know I'm going way over time because there's just so much cool information to put out. There's really cool things that we do. And if I can pause this video, yeah, uh, this is what's supposed to be the bonus video. I don't know. I'll let warrant officer sheets decide if we can run with it. I I know it's uh, fifteen or twenty minutes past. You know what? We're here. This is so much good stuff. Uh, I don't want to break up the flow. And this is really, really great, important history for the cadets. So uh, really look at this. If it wasn't for these brave people these generation two generations or three generations prior to us none of us would be here right now so these are the people that you know we should always be grateful for and uh, mc1 thank you so much for documenting this so yes please let's roll with it this is real important stuff all right If we ever go to war, the last place in the world I wanted to be trapped was down in the bowels of the ship. I wanted to be top size, 
if something happened, I could get off it. So I volunteered for antenna repair squad. I was with the radio division. It was Harold Comstock, Clarence Ross, Joe Mahofsky, Jim Owens, Joe Pace, and myself. So that morning, we went up to Battle Station, and there was nothing for us to do, six of us. So we got in line with the kids running out ammo to a three-inch, 50, small anti-aircraft gun. So we, this is what we were doing. There were five high altitudes, V formation, all five released at the same time. They just dropped them. We took one hit. Kaysen and Downs sitting in front of us took one hit. One landed out on the pier and down. And I guess the other two landed in the harbor. The one that hit our ship just happened to be where we were. The first thing I knew was I was flat on my face and my arms were in front of me. And they looked funny. They were all purple and bloody and peeled. So it dawned on me in a hurry. We got hit. And I finally picked myself up, wondered where the gun crew went. They were everywhere. They were all gone. And um, about that time now, it's a, a time element. I don't know whether it was 10 seconds or 30 seconds, maybe a minute, I have no idea. Then I heard some officer holler, get that man to sick bay. Pick me up and they put me in a bunk. And I still had no idea how badly I was injured. And then I, there was a fellow walked by, a radium and third Osman. So I said, hey, Ozzy. And he came over to the bunk and he looked at me and he said, who are you? And that's when I got a hint that maybe something's, something's wrong. So I said, it's Highland. And he did something very good for my morale. He backed away going, ah, ah. <laughs> that's when I realized I, I must be bad off. Shortly after that, feeling started coming back. And what, what had happened, my right ankle was shot open. I had a chip of bone out of the right leg. My right hand was ripped open. I had five pieces of shrapnel in the left leg. I had a piece blown out of my left thigh. I lost part of my left elbow, part of my left bicep. The Navy listed these as superficial wounds. I spent nine months in the hospital getting patched up, and then I went back to sea. I get asked, do you, ever, do you keep in touch with the other fellows from the antenna repair squad? And my answer is not yet. If you go out to the memorial circle we have in the, at the visitor center, you'll find Carol Comstock, Clarence Hoss, Joe Mahusky, Jim Owens, and Joe Pace under the Pennsylvania. So, 
the reason I wanted to share this video is, um, again, it's uh, we are immortalized the, the people's stories. And in this case, uh, I spent, oh uh, God, it's, cause, it's about an hour and a half. I think I have a recording of just him talking to the camera, him telling his story. There, There's a lot much more. This is just a condensed version to it. Uh, but again, you don't have necessarily that footage of this happening exactly or um, uh, how it how it occurred, how the attack occurred, ex except for some photos and videos from, from the archives. Uh, so recreating the story and make it, you know, visually appealing to the viewers, that's what MCs would do. So, you know, sometimes it's creating the footage out of, you know, old photos um, just to make... Uh, just to help retell the story, and that that's why I think my rate is my rating is absolutely fantastic because we we do immortalize people, we do tell the stories, and sometimes it, you know it can be a good story or a bad story, but it's us telling what the Navy do does, you know, telling the Navy story. So. If you have any more questions, go right ahead. Uh, and I'm sorry for rambling for too long. I can go on and on about how much I love my job. So <laughs> I'm sorry about that. There, there is absolutely nothing wrong with being passionate about what you do. That's the way everybody should be about everything that we do. Um, cadets, that last little movie clip that you saw, if you really want to see a superhero movie, that's what you watch. Because, again, that generation, we, we owe everything to them. And what he went through, um, it, it, it's, it's almost mind-numbing. And then he was back out into the fleet. So uh, a lot of people back then are a lot tougher than we are now. That um, is so true. Quinlan, yeah, all the, the questions that came through were, were asked during your presentation. And they were, were really good ones. And... To me, it really puts a good framework on the MC rate. I didn't have that depth of knowledge, right, of, of what happened. And don't take that disrespectfully because I just didn't really know. But now, you know, quite honestly, anyone that is interested in anything like this, I, as far as I'm concerned, I'm awestruck. This is definitely the way to go. So not only have I always been impressed with you being our PAO for this effort and from the first time I met you at the Army-Navy game, where, by the way, she did crawl around and got to meet everybody and no one ever stopped her. So uh, if you want access to everything at all times, be an MC. Uh, very, very impressive. So thank, thank you, you very much for sharing your sea stories and your actual real story. Very, very uh, a wonderful deal. So for our cadets, again, there, there'll be a quiz which pales in comparison to the content that you've seen right now, but go through it, get your two hours of virtual drilled credit, um, and rewatch the, the video as much as possible. Um, there's some really great stuff here. So Professor Quinlan, thank you very, very much for stepping in front of the camera. This is fantastic. Uh, STG1 Lewison did his best in the background to make sure everything fl uh, flowed and to get all the questions to me to ask for you. So again, this team's working out great. Uh, cadets, next uh, episode of Real uh, Sailors, Real Sea Stories is coming up in a couple days. So hope you're going to join us as well. Thank you again. Appreciate it. And everybody, take care. Have a good evening. Bye, everybody. <laughs>